Jesse, appreciate it. Please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This morning I'll be preaching Jesus from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 1 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 1 through 11. Um, if you came and you forgot your Bible, and if you don't have a smartphone and you can't access a Bible, we have four Bibles uh, on the back table there. You can freely g- go grab one. It's in the same translation that I'm preaching from, so and encourage you. I'm, re- I'm preaching from the English Standard Version. I don't think that this is the only good version. There's lots of good versions, by the way. I just preached from this one. Uh, so feel free to find that on your phone if you have it, or follow along in your own translation. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through um, 11, and we'll get to it in just a moment. If you didn't catch the message last week, uh, it's important that you know that we are embarking on a little series within a greater series that we are going through through Ephesians. So obviously now we can see 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 up there. Um, we are sort of halfway through the book of Ephesians, but in our study through Ephesians, which is such a great book that's helping us understand the true life, and we've kind of got all the doctrinal foundations through chapters 1 through 3 within Ephesians, which just helps us understand the gospel and the, how the blood of Jesus applies and how he breaks down the barriers between the Jews and the Gentiles, which breaks down the barriers it, racially now and things like that. We've gotten all of the, the doctrinal foundations down, and then he begins to talk about the application of the doctrine in verses or chapters 4 through 6, but we got to this verse last week in verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 4 that said this, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now the reference there is to the grace gifts or the spiritual gifts as they're also called. Paul then goes on in Ephesians 4 to write about how Jesus came to gift the church with these grace gifts, uh, which is just an awesome picture. He talks, it talks about, um, it's a reference from Psalms, you remember this, Psalms uh, 68, uh, where God uh, triumphs over the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Hittites, and he rises up to the top of the hill in Zion, where Jerusalem is on the hill. He conquers the enemies, and he gets all of the spoil from the enemies. Think like medieval times, you know, that kind of idea. He gets all the spoil from all the enemies, uh, and it's gifted to him. Well, Paul, the apostle, takes that same imagery from God, Yahweh, uh, going up and conquering Jerusalem. He applies that to Jesus, and how Jesus came down to the earth, humbly and beautifully, and he conquered the enemies, to enable to save us. He conquered sin. He conquered death. He conquered Satan. He conquered hell. And instead of receiving gifts from those enemies, because I don't know what good gift you could get from hell or Satan, nothing. Instead, Paul kind of switches it and says he gave gifts. So he, he conquered the enemy, took all these captives, and he gave gifts to us. We are the recipients, the people of God, that Jesus has given gifts to. And he can do that because he's ascended Above all things, he ascended out of the grave, and then after 40 days, he ascended up above all of the powers, all the demonic, supernatural powers that there are, and he is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, ruling and reigning, and he's given gifts to us. And that is sort of the background to spiritual gifts. So, so many in the church just kind of build spiritual gifts, like I'm, I'm, I'm more into the Bible. I'm not into spiritual gifts. I'm more into just focusing on the Bible, but I'm just like, I don't understand, like the Bible is full of the grace gifts, and Do you understand that what Jesus did to give us the grace gifts, not only does his ascension above all things help us obviously come to salvation, but he also did that so he can give us gifts to build up his body. And that's what Paul goes into in Ephesians 4. After he talks about how Jesus gave us the grace gifts, he then goes into what the ultimate goal of the church is. And that is to attain, for the church, the body of Christ, to attain the fullness of Christ And how do we do that? We do that through using the grace gifts. He's given us tools and resources to help us achieve the goal of the church. Why would we not use what he has given us? Um, He's given us resources and tools to help us build uh, ourselves up um, in the church. So last week, as we looked at Ephesians 4, 7 through 16, we sort of got this general introduction to the grace gifts. And this week, we're going to be doing another kind of introduction of sorts uh, in 1 Corinthians. My goal, and I believe that uh, is aligned with what God desires, is that by the end of this message, we would firstly understand the basic idea of grace gifts. So we're not leaving, kind of scratching our heads, still not quite understanding it. I want us to really try to grasp it together. 
um, and also to grasp their critical importance for today. So I really want all of us, including myself, to walk out of these doors today thinking, wow, like I don't want to just sort of leave the grace gifts to the side. Like I want to do what's commanded three times in Corinthians to earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. I want to do that. So I want you to see, I want us to all leave with this conviction to say, wow, we really need this. And then lastly, which ties into it, I want us to, um, to desire them earnestly. So at the end of this teaching, uh, we're going to have a little bit of a specific time of prayer for us to pursue God by means of the gifts together. So all right, uh, look, at, well, look with me, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. It says this, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Okay, we'll stop there. The way this verse is introduced helps us understand its place in this greater letter. I know that we're just sort of jumping into a letter and um, so much of biblical uh, understanding and hermeneutics is based on context. So let me just give us a quick context here. We find the same phrase, now concerning, or in your translation it might be now about. We see that at the beginning of chapter 7 in 1 Corinthians, uh, again in verse 25 of chapter 7, and also at the beginning of chapter 8. Paul, after these four points, would discuss a separate topic. It's as if the Corinthian church had these sort of these questions or concerns about these topics, and Paul wanted to address them so that they understood them. So there was already some understanding of spiritual gifts going on in in Corinth, but there was a question about it. Um, A lot of scholars think that some of the brothers and sisters in Corinth were maybe abusing the gifts or sort of making a higher hierarchy. Oh, like these people were speaking in tongues. They must be more spiritual. And then these people were doing this. And, da, da, da. and there was just a little bit of like confusion going on and pride going on. So they had a question about that. And Paul's like, okay, now concerning spiritual gifts, let me <laughs> set you straight. That's what Paul's kind of doing here, which is really important. Okay, so that's what he's doing. So when Paul writes now concerning spiritual gifts, we can understand that the Corinthian church needed some teaching. Next, in this one verse, we see... Um, how Paul described the gifts. The word Paul wrote is just one word in the Greek, and that is uh, pneumatikon, okay? It's an adjective. And an adjective, if you remember, go way back to grade seven, grade eight, it describes uh, a noun, okay? So it describes a noun. Um, and it's an adjective that gen- generally means spiritual. So a spiritual person, a spiritual gift. It's describing the noun, a person, place, or thing. Pneuma, as some of you might know, is the Greek word for spirit or wind, and sometimes there's that, always that um, uh, metaphor in scripture of the wind and spirit, how God breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, and the wind came, and the spirit came, so there's always that kind of uh, metaphor going on, but what is he describing as spiritual? Because in the Greek, it's just one word, it's just now concerning spiritual. (laughs) Translations add in gifts or persons, But to help us be more confident in adding gifts here, or things at least, is that um, other than in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, these three chapters, okay, 12, 13, 14, are all about the gifts, okay, all about the gifts. Um, And they use another Greek word to describe them, and that is the word that you might know as charisma, okay? It's where we get the word charismatic, okay? Charismatic is not a scary word, by the way. It's a Greek word, okay? The charisma is just a plural Uh, understanding of the gifts, okay? The charisma, okay? And charis, as some of you know, is grace. That's why we get the idea of grace gifts or spiritual gifts, grace gifts. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, you can actually look there if you want to in in the Bible. It says this, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual, that's the same word, pneumatikon, especially that you may prophesy. So again, Paul's word here for spiritual gifts is that just that one adjective, but we can be confident to add in the word gifts or things, because what does Paul continue with? He says, especially that you may prophesy. That's a grace gift. So he's giving a concrete example of one of the spiritual gifts or things, and these spiritual gifts are also called charisma, grace gifts. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 gives us... <clears throat> The, the introduction of what we are going to be getting into, but there's one more thing to note in this first verse in Corinthians 12, verse 1. It says, I do not want, or he says, I do not want you to be uninformed. We are not to be uninformed regarding the grace gifts. Do you see how Paul writes that? See, a misinformed understanding or use of the grace gifts is damaging to the church and to individuals in the church. Like any doctrine or anything, 
If we don't understand it really well and we're starting to use it, it can become damaging. It's no secret, okay, that spiritual gifts have been sort of abused, like the church in Corinth was probably abusing them as well. And because of this abuse, many do not touch them. They say, I don't want to hear anything about it. They'll, they'll skip over that, right? They'll skip over 1 Corinthians 14 because there's just too many things that are just confusing. But it's also the case that many don't believe that all of the gifts are active and available to the church today. Now, there are obviously different perspectives to this, of course, but generally, in a very kind of general way, uh, this is referred to as uh, cessationism, okay? And it's called this because it believes that at least some of the gifts have ceased to operate in the life of the church. Um, so th- they were there in the beginning of the church, the beginning in the f- like kind of the first century, especially with the official apostles like the Twelve and Paul and others, but not anymore. That's, it was a certain age when those gifts were um, used, and some believe that they were just used to sort of jumpstart, kickstart the church, and then they, need, they can go on without them. Uh, but I agree with uh, Paul when he writes the Corinthians that he doesn't want them to be uninformed of those spiritual gifts because I do believe that they are active today. Uh, and there's much that we can learn from Paul uh, as we get into this. I, I personally uh, don't want to be uninformed, and I don't want any of us to be uninformed in either way, in a, in a way that we're abusing them and it's just kind of crazy, or in a way that says, let's just bury them and we'll focus on other things. Uh, we don't want either of that, because that's both of misinformation, uh, 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 misguidance on, on the gifts. And I hope and pray that through this little series within a series and these three chapters, 12, 13, 14, we would actually gain from the Holy Spirit a better and a greater uh, understanding of the, of the gifts. All right, so to guide us in our series of the grace gifts, we're going to be waking, making our way through 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14. And I'll just give a very brief overview of where we're going to be going here, okay? The first part of verse, 1 Corinthians 12 really sets the foundation for what the grace gifts are, okay? That's what we're going to be looking at today. The rest of 1 Corinthians 12 helps us see that the church is the body of Christ where every single member matters. It doesn't matter who they are, what grace gift they may have been uh, you know, endowed with to, to benefit the church. It doesn't matter. They matter. Everyone matters in the church. 1 Corinthians 13, some of you uh, already know about, is all about love, right? And how exercising grace gifts in the church without love is worthless, some of you know that, like in the beginning of 1 Corinthians 13, um, it's so, it, I just love the imagery. Paul basically says, it doesn't matter if you can speak in the tongues of angels or men or anything, if you don't have love, you're just going to be like a gong and a symbol, annoying to people, okay? Uh, or it doesn't matter if you have all of the prophetic mysteries and you can speak things and foretell things, it doesn't matter. If you don't have love, then you are nothing. Like, that, that's heavy language. So, 1 Corinthians 13 is so essential for us to understand. And we're going to be spending some time there as we go through this series because we need love if we are going to be a church that wants to build up the church. We need love for one another. So we're going to be seeking that very uh, strongly, okay? So that's 13. And then 1 Corinthians 14, Paul gives us sort of the heart uh, for building up the body of Christ when we are gathered together. So 1 Corinthians 14 really is about the corporate gathering. And he uses two gifts throughout this whole thing as examples. He talks about prophecy and tongues. And basically, he, sh- he goes to show how prophecy is better in a church gathering because it's intelligible. And the most important thing in a church gathering is for people to understand and be built up. So if tongues are just kind of going on in church gathering and there's no one interpreting the tongues, Paul's like, no, because it's just going to be confusing. Outsiders are going to look in and say, you're crazy. But if someone prophesies, if all prophesy and someone shows up and they kind of look in, they're going to be convicted to their core. They're going to fall on their knees and they're going to worship God and they're going to say, God is really among you. I don't know about you, but I want a church where outsiders, when they come and they see, they're not going to open our doors and they're going to see, oh, it just looks like a rotary meeting or, oh, it just looks like the knitting club or whatever. I also don't want them to see, oh, wow, it's a crazy cult in there because they're all going off and they're crazy. How about they look in the windows and they begin to hear sort of the deep things going on in their heart through the the gift of prophecy and they're brought to their knees and they're able to actually say, wow, God is really among you. And obviously, I know for some of us, some of these things are a little bit like, wow, I have not approached that before. 
I want you to just to know, and you, you, your favorite verse in this whole thing might be the very last verse, 1, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40, all things should be done decently and in order. It's very Baptist, and it's very good, and I agree with that. Let's do it decently, and let's do it in order, because that's the, that's the proper way as well. Okay, so that's sort of the basic overview of where we're going to be going in this series within a series. Now, before we dig into 1 Corinthians 12, verses 2 through 11, we've already done the number one, um, let me say this. The grace gifts are not about the grace gifts, okay? Grace gifts, rather, are about the glory of God. This is very, very important. In 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11, uh, we, we read this. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it, okay? 1, Corinthians, or 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, verses 10 through 11. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks, Speak as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves, serve as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. And then listen, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's all about God's glory. And God's glory, when, when God is glorified, we are helping, not helping him, but we're, we're, we're sort of reflecting to him who he is because we want the world to see who God is. So when God is displayed for who he truly is, he's glorified. And the way that we glorify him is primarily through Jesus, just like Peter wrote, glorified through Jesus. God, uh, glorify God through Jesus. Jesus himself uh, makes this so clear in his prayer in John chapter 17, the high priestly prayer. He gets on his knees in verse 1, right at the beginning of the prayer, he says this, Father, the hour has come. This is right before he is betrayed and, and goes to the cross. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, me, so that the Son may glorify you. Because God is glorified through the Son. And Kent mentioned, talking about the Polish Jews, one of the reasons why we want to pray for Jewish people who are in Judaism is that they worship Yahweh. But how is Yahweh glorified? Through Jesus the Messiah. It has to be through Jesus the Messiah. And that's so, so essential. So we'll, we'll continue to pray for our Jewish uh, brothers and sisters and pray that they see the Messiah because that's the way that they can glorify their Father, God. Grace gifts are not about grace gifts, so let's not make them about grace gifts, okay? Um, or about those who exercise grace gifts, okay, like you and me. But grace gifts are about glorifying God through Jesus Christ. The question is, how do we best glorify God through Jesus Christ? Well, this is done by first recognizing that we, okay, the church, are the body of Christ on earth. Okay, and then after we recognize that, that we are the body of Christ, remember when Paul is going to go and he's, uh, before Paul is Paul, he's Saul and he's persecuting the church and he's on his way to Damascus to rip men and women out of their homes and to place them in prison and on the way he's struck with this light and and Jesus himself says, Paul, or Saul, Saul, why are, you, why are you persecuting me? I love that. Not, why are you persecuting my people? He doesn't say that. Why are you persecuting the church? Why are you persecuting the way? Why are you persecuting the brothers and sisters who, who believe in me, who worship me? He doesn't say that. That's all true. But what he says is, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because the church is the body of Christ. So when the church is injured and hurt and persecuted, Jesus himself feels it. Just like when one of us suffers, the whole body suffers. Well, Jesus is the head. He'll suffer too. It's all part of, of that. So we have to recognize that we are the body of Christ. And then, how do we best glorify God through Jesus? We strive together to build up the body until we all attain to the fullness of Christ. If you were last year, uh, last, sorry, if you were here last week, you would know that this is exactly what Paul wrote uh, to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 uh, through to 13. I'm going to read it uh, again just so we can all stay connected on what he's saying here. Uh, in chapter 4 of uh, verse or chapter 4 verse 11 through 13 he says this, and he Jesus gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, so these are gifts, to equip the saints, which is all of us, for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain, so it's like a goal, until we get something, and that is the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, which is mature manhood, adulthood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Lots of language there, but basically is we are to build up the body of Christ until we reach the fullness of Christ. 
And that's what we are to do. God is glorified through Jesus as we, the church, uh, we, the church, uh, build one another up so that we may grow more and more into maturity. That is the fullness of Christ. Because Jesus is the image of the invisible God, that is, he's the perfect reflection of God, the exact radiance of the glory of God, we who are being built up into more and more of who Jesus is then glorify God more and more as we become more and more like Jesus. Does that make sense? The more we actually become more like Christ, we begin to glorify God because we're reflecting God more and more. And that's how God is glorified. So, grace gifts are these glorious resources, and we'll actually find that they're not necessarily resources or tools, they're actually the manifestation of the Holy Spirit himself that God has given to the body of Christ to help us grow more into Christ. And as we grow into Christ, as we mature, God is glorified. The church displays the wonder and power and love of God because the church, when it is healthy, is growing more and more into the fullness of Christ, who is the perfect display of God. All right, we looked at verse 1. Let's move to verses 2 and 3. You can follow along. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now, what does this have to do with grace gifts? It's a little strange, a little odd. We must remember who we were before we met Christ, okay? The true church, that is the genuine body of Christ, is made up of blood-bought individuals, you and me, who are not enslaved to the world anymore, okay? And who are filled with the Spirit of God. Paul wrote earlier in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, he says, do you not know that you, plural, you all, are God's temple, that God's Spirit dwells in you, right? For God's temple is holy, you are that temple. So the church, even our church here, this, this gathering, doesn't matter how big or uh, smart or what we look like or how we, whatever, it's just we as a body, a collective, a gathering here, we are that temple, temple of the Holy Spirit. Is the church just some other community group? No, we are the dwelling place of Almighty God, which is crazy. Just think about that for a moment, that we are the actual dwelling place of God. Went from the garden and Eden to the tabernacle, to the temple, to the rebuilt temple, to the other rebuilt temple, really nice temple, to Jesus, and then to us. We are the dwelling place of God. It's amazing. We've, we, we talked about that more extensively in an uh, earlier sermon in Ephesians. Uh, before you or I joined in this church, not this church, but joined in the gathering of, of believers, we were pagans. We unknowingly followed the ruler of this world, Satan, and we were enslaved to sin. My father-in-law, whenever he sees little kids, like even his own kids and like our little kids, like he just says, oh, cute little pagans, uh, because that's who they are right? My, my uh, three-year-old and my uh, 11-month-old, and I mean, God, we pray for their salvation every single day. Maybe God has already filled them and everything like that, but man, they can act paganish a little bit, um, like a lot of us can too. Uh, we need the grace of God. But as Paul writes, we were led astray in many ways to mute idols, okay? That is these gods, lowercase g gods, that didn't have any life in them to give us, there was some sort of like faux life that they said to give, like power and money and sex, all these sort of gods of the day. There's some sort of this allurement. They seem alive. They seem like they can give us everything we want, but they don't. They can't actually give us anything. Spiritually, they are absolutely mute, right? Uh, we think about the, the old idols in the days of the prophets, and they would, they would make these little statues and gods. And in other places, in the, in the more like Eastern Asia, they actually have a lot of still shrines and these like stones and wood. But the prophets are like, guys, can you not see that they, they're just wood? It's just rock. They don't speak. They can't hear. They can't feel. There's nothing they can give you. Same thing with the idols of today. Even though they may seem more alive, they're exactly the same. They're completely inanimate. They can't really do anything. Spiritually, they are absolutely dead. They are, they're lifeless, okay? Uh, as Paul writes, we were led astray in many ways to these mute idols, and we said and we did a lot of things that were abhorrent to God. Things that were lifeless, things that were foolish, even things that were blasphemous. Some of us know our old life and think, yeah, that's true. That's true. Following mute idols led us to basically 
lifelessness, lifeless talk, lifeless actions. But what's important to know is that when we trusted in the gospel and were saved by the blood of Jesus, the Spirit of God filled us, changed us, and continues to change us. The greatest change that the Spirit has brought about in us because of our conversion is that we can now truly and honestly say, Jesus is Lord. Now, a lot of people can say that today and not mean it in their heart. But those that are truly saved can say it, and it's true. Unbelievers can't truly say it. Like from, I mean, they can say it with their mouth, but anyone can say anything with their mouth. But truly in their heart, unbelievers cannot say Jesus is Lord because they don't believe it. If they do, they're just lying to themselves. This groundwork is important before we get into the grace gifts um, because, and here's why, uh, consider prophecy, consider tongues, okay? These can sound and look a little different than we're used to, okay? But because of who we are in Christ, because of the Spirit of God in us, we do not need to fear that we're doing or saying something dangerous or evil or wicked. And we don't need to criticize others either. Honestly saying Jesus is Lord, along with the use of all the other grace gifts we'll get into, comes from the indwelling of the Spirit of God in us. We are not pagans anymore, saying and doing lifeless, even abhorrent things. Yes, we're still going to stumble and fall, but the Spirit will convict us, bring us back. The Spirit of God in us is crucial as we begin exercising the grace gifts so that we can look around to one another, even to our own selves, and be like, okay, the Spirit of God dwells in me. I can't say Jesus is a curse. So as we begin to move into the gifts of the Spirit, into the grace gifts, we don't need to be really and super like on edge all the time to say, I'm going to say something that's completely abhorrent to God. Uh, We're going to stay decently in order. We're going to stay absolutely biblical. We're going to only do as God tells us what we can do, but we're not going to be in fear because we're not pagans anymore, following, following mute idols. We are filled with the Spirit of God. We now come to verses 4 through 11. This is what Paul writes, verses 4 through 11. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. It's actually healings. It's a plural word there. Gifts of healings by the one Spirit. Verse 10, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. And lastly, verse 11, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Okay, you can clearly see that in verses 8 through 10, there is a list of nine grace gifts. Before it and after it, Paul fills in seven foundational truths about the grace gifts. And we're going to look at the foundation, foundation, foundational truths first. Then we'll list the other grace gifts that the other places in the New Testament mention just to give us an, 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 an idea of the array of the gifts. And then we're going to see the importance of the grace gifts followed by uh, how we can pursue them, okay? Here are the foundational truths about the grace gifts. Some of this we, went, we mentioned last week, okay? Firstly, we can see in verses 4, 5, and 6 that the grace gifts are described as gifts service, and activities. Therefore, grace gifts are given to do something, not just to be looked at, not to put a badge on you, like, a, you're going, you, like a, what, what's the brownies and Boy Scouts? You know, you've got all these badges. Well, I got this one, this one, this one, this one. It's not like that, okay? They, they do something. They're service. They're activities, things that you do. You know, we all might have that family member or friend uh, who collects Anything and everything that has a certain brand of it, okay? Think Star Wars, think Coca-Cola, Hot Wheels, you know what? Maybe you're that person, so plug your ears because you might be offended here. Do you know what I mean? Those people that just have a whole room dedicated to everything Coca-Cola or Star Wars or whatever, right? Do some of you know that kind of, okay. Some of, yeah, like these people have a whole room dedicated to various things that are marked with that brand. So imagine, okay, a Hot Wheels fanatic who collects them but never opens them. They're all in their packages. I don't know about you, but Hot Wheels are to play with. They're toys for seven-year-olds to enjoy on the ground, to go outside and make mud 
and like do mud bogs with them and things like that. In the same way, I know I just uh, maybe offended some people that have everything packaged, sealed, and perfectly in mint condition. That's fine. We can talk later. But what I'm, the point I want to get after this, grace gifts are to be used in the mud, like nitty-gritty in people's lives. They're not to be like, oh, I'm just going to place them up on my shelf. Like, this is what God has given me. I'm just going to leave it here in this one room for people to admire. I mean, think about that. Like, if a church who says we believe in the gifts but never uses them, it doesn't make any sense. It would be like a seven-year-old, like one of Mike's little boys walking into, let's say I had a room full of Hot Wheels, and he walks, he's like, wow, and he gets excited because he wants to experience the joy of playing with them. And I say, no, 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 just look, don't touch. <laughs> it's like, what? No, we want to use them. So grace gifts are acts of service. They're activities. They are gifts to be given and used for our joy, for our building up, and that's so so important, okay? Second, so that's the first thing. Gifts are to be used. They move. They work. Second, as, they, uh, as, the, as these same verses show, there is a variety um, or different kinds of grace gifts. So if you look at the ber- beginning of uh, verse 10, we uh, see, oh yeah, okay, just an example. To another, the working of miracles, okay? That's a grace gift, okay? And the word for miracles uh, is the same word translated as power. So this is the grace gift where a Christian works divine power through their life to gift, serve, and act for the church. So as you can see, I'm using this example of uh, m- a work of miracle because there's an obviously kind of supernatural flavor to that grace gift, right? You're working divine power, you know, splitting of the Red Sea. Like that's power, that's supernatural, that's kind of irrational, it's against science today, against reason. It's like, wow, this is obviously something is supernatural going on here. But then look over to verse 28 in chapter 12. Tucked into another list of grace gifts, we find helping and administrating. So my point is this. You have one Christian who is working miracles, like divine power, and then another Christian who is just managing the gathering, ensuring everyone's fed in the potluck, you know, knows how to knows, make sure everyone knows how to get around. <laughs> Listen, one's not more or less a supernatural display, which is an amazing reality, though it might look like that outwardly. As we're going to see, all gifts in action, not on display, but gifts in action, are manifestations of the Holy Spirit of God. However, there is a variety, obviously, as miracles and administration clearly shows, and that's awesome. There's a variety. All right, third foundational point. Notice that Paul intentionally makes the effort to show the Corinthians that All of God is involved in the grace gifts. Verses 4, 5, and 6 again tell us that the varieties of gifts and service and activities, all the grace gifts are by the same Spirit, same Lord, same God. This is a clear reference to the Trinity. As you can see, all of God is involved in the giftings uh, to us of the grace gifts. Fourth, as verse 6 tells us, God is the one who empowers these gifts in each church member. Verse 11 agrees with this in saying that when the gifts are used and they are displayed in and for the church to benefit from them, God is empowering them through the Holy Spirit. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit. All the grace gifts involve God's empowerment and working in their use, and they're given to everybody. Fifth, we spent time last week pressing the fact that, as verse 7 shows, to each in the church a grace gift is given. You and I have at least one grace gift. Sixthly, as we already mentioned, grace gifts, as verse 7 shows, are manifestations of the Spirit. Revelations, like displays of the very Holy Spirit of God. When a grace gift is gifted, served, acted forth, the Spirit himself is working. It's not the, just the power or the wisdom or intelligence of the person, it's God. It's also not just the force or the power of God, void of God, it's the power of God because it is God, the Holy Spirit. All right, um, seventh, grace gifts are for the common good. For the common good, we see that in verse seven. This is repeated often because it's so important to God that we understand that our use of grace gifts are for others, not for us, not to, not to pride us up and puff us up. It's, it's for others. Grace gifts are gifted to us to gift others so that the whole church is built up into the fullness of Christ. We read it already in 1 Peter 4, 10. Grace gifts are given to serve one another. And the last one here, uh, I guess there's eight of these, my bad, eight. We see in verse 11 that the Holy Spirit apportions or distributes the gifts to each individual in the church as he chooses. 
as he apportions them. We don't pick them according to our will, like we'd go into, you know, Birchwood Dairy and say, I want this flavor and this flavor. We don't do that. God picks for us according to his will and purposes. However, we play a part in his picking by earnestly desiring. So it's like, you're like a, a seven-year-old again at the, you know, array of the different flavors of ice cream, and you're like, oh, can I please have this one? But ultimately, it'll be your parent who decides. Same thing with this kind of with God. He wants us to earnestly desire the gifts, all of them, right? It's like, I, said, I want all the ice cream, you know, <laughs> like many seven-year-olds would do. I want all of it, right? But it's God who apportions to each one individually as he wills, okay? So there is the eight foundational truths of the grace gifts. Now, here's a summary definition, then, of grace gifts, and I'm going to quote from the same author I quoted from last week, Sam Storms, who's done a lot of work with this. He says this, a spiritual gift, or a grace gift, is when the Holy Spirit manifests his presence and imparts his power into and through individual believers to enable them to exceed the limitations of their finite humanity so that they might faithfully and effectively fulfill certain ministry tasks for the building up of the body of Christ. That's grace gifts. Now, what are the grace gifts? Great question. This week, I went through the relevant passages and just listed all that I could find, okay, in the New Testament. So here are the grace gifts I could find. They're not in any particular order. Um, If you want references, biblical references to these, I will give them to you after the service. So here we go. I'm just going to list them all. The utterance of wisdom, the utterance of knowledge. So this is the message, the actual speaking out, the logos of wisdom, the logos of Sophia, right? This is the speaking forth of wisdom. Utterance of wisdom, utterance of knowledge, faith, gifts of healings, the working of miracles or powers, prophecy, bringing revelation, the ability to distinguish between spirits, various kinds of tongues, the interpretation of tongues, apostles, prophets, teachers, leading a lesson, teaching, helping, administrating, understanding mysteries and knowledge, giving away everything, martyrdom, leading a hymn or spiritual song, service, exhortation, contribution, leadership, acts of mercy, speaking, evangelists, and shepherds, or which is the same as pastors. That's quite the list. It's a huge list and quite the variety, right? Now, I want us to notice a few things here. Firstly, this list, if you understood grammatically, is full of things like prophecy and also actions like administrating and also people like an evangelist. Do you notice that? So as we went through the list, there were things, there was actions, and there was people. There's things like mercy, actions like, like a, you know, singing, like a hymn, and then again, like a position, like an apostle. And it's important that we understand that. Secondly, we can also say that these are probably not all the grace gifts. Okay, the way that they're sort of mentioned and written about doesn't seem to conclude that, you know, these are the final 29 or whatever. Notice, for example, that in verse 8 of our passage, Paul writes of, you can see in verse 8, um, for to one is given through the spirit of utterance of wisdom and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. Well, these are obviously speaking gifts. It's the message. It's the utterance of these things. We can then look at verse 28 and see that Paul writes of teachers, a position. Teachers speak. And in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, Paul imagines someone bringing a lesson to the church as their grace gift. Teachers teach a lesson, and usually that's at least through speaking. So consider all of that. And then in 1 Peter 4, 11, we have Peter writing of the grace gift of speaking. Well, to me, I don't know if you just followed that. That's a lot there. But just, if you didn't follow it, I'll just say this messages of wisdom and knowledge and lessons that are taught by teachers and everything in between are all under the banner of the grace gift of speaking. Do you understand? So they're really using it loosely and organically in and through all of this. The point is, I don't think Paul and Peter were working from some, you know, revered list of the grace gifts that they made sure every church made sure that they only have these ones, you know. I don't think that's the way that it happened, right? Uh, They were a lot more fluid and organic in their discussion of the grace gifts. They have given us a wide array of things, actions, and people that serve the church through grace gifts. Now, in the coming weeks, we're going to actually go through these, um, spending obviously different amounts of time on the the various ones according to what needs most explanation. So prophecy, for example, will take some time for us to really grasp, okay, what do we mean by that? What does that look like? 
um, administration, we aren't going to take a lot of time there because it's a little bit more self-explanatory, but we're going to make our way through all of them. Now, from understanding what the grace gifts are, we can already see their importance for the church. Um, and here's a way that I want us to help us understand the importance. I want you to think about a building project. I think about uh, Ken and Nina, their daughter Michelle and her husband Justin are building a home. Some of you know that, building a home up in Vanderhoof right now. So that's kind of been on Ken's mind and obviously Justin and Michelle's mind for a lot, building a home. Think about a building project. You're going to build a house like Justin and Michelle, okay? Um, for a house, you need the blueprints. Then uh, you, after buying your land, you need all the hardware. So think about it, nails, wood, piping, wiring, windows, drywall, screws, everything, right? But you also need the tools to install or shape the hardware, right? So you're not just going to like take a screw, like use your finger and like screw it into the two by fours. You need tools to do that. Hammers, saws, wire cutters, power drills. And we all know as well that we need workers to actually use the tools. You do not want to hire me to build your house. It's not going to work very well. You need carpenters, plumbers, electricians, people that are certified contractors. The goal is what? A finished house. And it takes blueprints, hardware, tools, and specialty workers to get it all done. Now, consider the church as the unfinished house of God. When Jesus comes back and we become fully mature in him, then we're going to be complete and finished. Until then, we are all living stones being built on one another, being built up into the house of God. Until then, we strive to build the body, to build the house well. The blueprints of this building is the Bible. The Word of God tells us everything we need to know about the shape of the church, what's it to be, how it functions, etc. We follow the Word as we build the church, just like a contractor follows the blueprints as he builds the house. Now, grace gifts, as described in the New Testament, are like the list of hardware, tools, and people that are all needed and all important for the finishing of the house, the house of God. The, the, fini the finishing of the church uh, is when it attains to the fullness of Christ. Try building a house with only the blueprints and no hardware, tools, or people. Can't be done. It would just be a theory. It'd be a threat. Oh, this house would look really nice. Let's gather every single Sunday and just look at how great this house could be. That's not the church. That doesn't make any sense. It would be, you couldn't really do it. You need the tools. You need the hardware. You need the people. Sure, we could, you know, grab some sticks and throw some mud together and do something, but it wouldn't last. Grace gifts are what God has given the church to help build it up. Of course, our redeemed lives alone help build up the church, obviously, but God has graciously given so much more, the grace gifts, because he knows that we need them to help build up his body, the church, unto maturity. So therefore, let us pursue the gifts, and let's pursue them earnestly. I want to finish with quoting these handful of verses. 1 Corinthians 12, 31 earnestly desire the higher gifts, like prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Down to verse 5, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. Some of you are like, wait a second, Paul just say he wants us all to speak in tongues? Like, that's crazy. Right there in verse 5 of chapter 14. The context here is in a church gathering where prophecy is understandable, but tongues, it's a different language, so unless someone's there to interpret, he wants them to prophesy more, okay? And then, way down to verse 39, we read, earnestly desire to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues. The gist of this is that God desires that we desire, and desire earnestly to receive from the Spirit of God himself through the grace gifts especially the grace gift of prophecy. In the Greek, the three times that earnestly desire is used, it's in the imperative. Again, go back to grade seven grammar. That means it's a command. It's an imperative. This is a command that we are to do. We are commanded by God to earnestly desire the grace gifts. Why? Circle back to the beginning of our argument, because God cares about his glory. And God is glorified through Jesus. And the church is the body of Jesus, the body of Christ, who is to grow into full maturity. And the church, in its pursuit of maturity in Christ, is glorifying to God. And the way that we do that is through the use of the grace gifts, decently and in order in the church. I'll steal once more from Sam Storms, who gives two ways we can earnestly desire the grace gifts, remembering that they are ultimately from God, obviously. But he wants a church where every member longs 
for the manifestation of himself uh, through the gifts. Okay? The first way Storms, uh, the first way Storms gives is not surprising. He just writes this. There is little, if any, hope for the proper use of spiritual gifts apart from a focused and consistent commitment to praying. God gives to those who seek. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. This is Luke chapter 11. How much more will our good Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Luke 11. Secondly, uh, he, he says this. It might surprise you a little bit, but he says this. It's actually fasting. Fasting, this is as he says, Sam Storms, is consistently portrayed in Scripture as one of the primary ways that we seek God and those blessings that he has promised to us if only we would ask. So I would encourage you, as I, as I challenge myself, to set aside time to fast during this series. Whether it's a meal a, a day or a, a day of meals, whatever it might be, days of meals, whatever can work with you in your pursuit of God and what he has given the church. And in that pursuit of God and his glory, we pursue all that God gives to help his glory shine.